I want to share with you something that I struggled with for years and maybe you've had the same frustration with hand planes. I'm going to share with you some key tips of setup and use of a variety of my planes. I'm not going to go all into like the, the whole tune up sharpening using a plane because I've done that already in other videos. We're going to link you to that. It'd be way too much to do in one night. I want to mainly talk about the key elements of setup and techniques and using your different planes. Now, if you noticed in the cabinet behind me on the wall, I've got an assortment of different types of planes, but I don't have one of those cabinets that's massive with, you know, 20 planes, which I admire. I love the looks of those, those cabinets. But when I built this one, I didn't want to build a big one. I, would, I guess I'm lazy that way. And I, and I just wanted to put the planes that I knew I was going to use. In fact, almost all the tools in here are what I think of as my starting lineup. You know, my first stringers. I, I go to these a lot. And so I wanted also to build the cabinet so I could quickly grab them and return them without, you know, a lot of problems. So that's, that's how this is set up. But in choosing which planes to put in there, I had to pick those that were specific to certain uh, types of, of cutting, like some type of process that they're most helpful for. And I didn't want them to be redundant. So that's why I've got my, my larger hand planes up here and then some smaller block planes. I'm not going to get into the specialty planes like the router plane and the uh, shoulder plane here. For now, we're just going to talk about the regular, fairly standard bench planes. All right. So let's start with probably a good one to start with. If you're going to have just one in your collection, the number five jack plane. It's, it's known as a jack plane. I only recently learned this and I, and I hope person was right. I think they were. It was Nick tagged the jack plane because it's kind of a jack of all trades plane. It's, it's sort of in the middle size range. It's a little longer than here's look at how much different this is. This is the number four. I think the jack had like a growth spurt because if you look at the all the planes, it's quite a jump from the four to the five. But the jack plane is a little better than the four, I think, because it's a better truing plane. So if you're going to have one, you could, you could have either of these two, but this is the standard bench plane. Now Stanley designed these planes to try to hit the middle of all the tasks. So there's some key elements about this plane. If you look right here, I'm going to just take off this lever cap. And then I'm taking out the cutting iron. The reason I took this apart is I want you to see this piece right here. This is called the frog. The frog is set up at 45 degrees on a standard bench plane. So imagine this is a 45 degree angle here. This is the, fro the frog. So that's your standard bench, bench plane angle. On this type of plane where the where the frog is at 45 degrees or around there, you have the bevel. This is a magnification of the cutting blade here or the iron. This is the profile of the iron. It's got a bevel on it. The bevel is down. So here it is. The bevel side is going to be down when it's set up in there. So as I plane, like let's say this is a board here. running out of ink, like here's the grain of the board. As I plane, that cutting edge is hitting that blade at effectively, let's say, this 45 degree angle, okay? Well, I don't know how to draw this. I got curls coming off there, okay? <laughs> As I'm going along, I'm cutting along. It's cutting a nice shaving at 45 degrees because the actual cutting angle of this blade, because the bevel is down, is 45. You see, that's on the top there. Now that's pretty standard. That'll get you through a lot of 
issues. And that's pretty standard for a flat sawn, I, I mean a flat cut. I'm gonna just make a few cuts with this and then we'll talk about the other style. All right, so let's set this back up again. I'm gonna put the bevel down. And typically when you sharpen a, a plain blade like this, usually they're ground at about 25 to 35 degrees. So this bevel, sorry, this bevel here could be 25 to 30 degrees. It doesn't really matter how much that bevel is because your effective angle of cutting is still 45 because your bevel is down, okay? So you got the 45. What it does affect is the, the wider, the, the cut there, the, it's not blunter, but it is, it is technically blunter if you go to a 35 degree angle. It'll last longer, the cutting edge will last longer than a 25, but it's, it's subtly sh less sharp, okay? But I usually sh keep mine at around 30 degrees. And that's actually what like companies like Lee Nielsen recommend. Keep your, your blades sharpened to about 30 degrees. Now I've got a leg in here. This is just a, a simple like straight tapered leg. These shine beautifully making this kind of cut. Now, I should set this up first. I've got the iron in there. And when you set it up, I like to look at it and try to see it coming above the sole of the plane, okay? So I usually like to look at it against a white wall or something light or a piece of paper on the bench. And I'm gonna hold it so I can just see the whole sole like reflecting off the paper. And then I can see that, that blade come up above the sole much easier. So I'm just cranking it down. I'm starting to see it. I'm gonna go a little over and I'm, I'm high on this side. So I'm gonna push the little adjustment lever over and until it looks about parallel. Now I'm gonna back it off doesn't have to stick out that far. And that looks about right. Now, what I go into in the other video about sharpening, when we get into the sharpening thing, is this type of plane, the number f the five, I like to have a little camber on it, which just means a very soft kind of angle. Like if we were looking at this blade from the front, here's how wide it is. Let's say it's a two inch wide blade. I'm gonna exaggerate this, but it has a soft little curve like that. Now it's, the extreme curve are called scrub planes, but this is just a little soft camber on here. Now, we don't use planes the way they used to in the old days. They actually would thickness wood this way, smooth uh, rough sawn board, go right from a rough sawn board and flatten it and think that's what apprentices were for. They were on the benches just killing themselves, but they probably got really good at it. So the initial planes that you would hit the work with had fairly severe cambers because they were quick at removing material and they'd go diagonally and across and basically the human joiner. <laughs> you know, you joint one edge and then you'd mark around and you'd have to flatten and basically then thickness plane the board. We don't have that problem, right? So we're much more civilized and we use our planes in a much more civil manner. We don't do that. But in that time, you might have seen a number six. This was commonly used with a heavier camber for cleaning up material. Also, um, scrub planes, some of them are quite narrow and you can remove a tremendous amount of material quickly. But anyway, what we usually use this type of plane for is to just clean surfaces from tool marks. So this tapered leg has been run through the table saw. It's got some nasty table saw cuts. And there's a burn mark on there. But rather than try to sand that and mess up that whole surface and probably end up rounding it if I use an aggressive You'd never use an orbital on this. It'd be hard to keep on there and you'd end up with a, a rounded looking leg. So you can very quickly get set up. Now I'm not sure where this is, but I'm going to look down through here on, in the mouth of the plane and I want to see that shaving coming out in the middle. 
Okay, that's close. And the way I'm using this now is I'm holding down the nose because there's a taper here. It's flat here. See, I've got a taper. So I'm going to bring it back, hold down the nose, and then feel it catch and just push forward. So I'm taking a really kind of thin, wispy shaving here. And it's a little uneven, so I'm going to, it's about to get flat though. I just set it a little heavier. And there we have that sweet sound. And I'm get, I've got a perfect pristine surface there. Now I can just rotate and again. So this is a nice way to begin hand planing is planing material that's narrower than the mouth or the blade of your iron here so that you're covering the whole thing. You're not getting a lot of resistance and it's an enjoyable experience. Now, one of the very, very key elements of setup and what I'm always going for is a thin, even in thickness across shaving. Okay. Thin and even. So I backed this way off and then I just advanced it. You saw how we had it all the way back and then you're going to just advance it until you start creating a shaving. Now watch, I'll do this again. I'll back it off. So this is where the frustration was for me initially. I always had the blade out a little too far. So I've got it just barely catching, hardly feeling anything. And it's just really easy to push. And then I'll dial it slightly. Now I'm catching a beautiful effortless shaving here. See how that's what you want to be. That's the sweet spot right there where you just advance it enough to just get a thin gossamer shaving. You can see through it. It's, it's, but you don't necessarily have to stay there. You can go a little higher, see what you can handle. Now, one of the big keys of it having that, that wonderful experience is to keep the soul waxed. I did that before you showed up tonight. I took a, uh, some of this, carnauba wax and I wiped it on there. You can use paraffin. Uh, you could use a spray type wax if you want, but that's the other key. So thin, even, and just wax the sole and you will have a wonderful time. If you're just beginning, do yourself a favor and start with pine. It's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. You will get less resistance. It's like a creamy textured wood that is a real joy to plane. So let me just show you what that feels and looks like. And then we'll go to some harder woods. All right. So I've just got a piece of pine in here and just so you can see what I'm doing, I'm going to put a pencil mark on there. Uh, better yet, let's use pen. Okay. Can you see that? So, what our modern problem usually that needs hand planing is the chatter mark from the planer or joiner or whatever. And I can see all these striations going across the wood here from the knives on the head. And you've got to get rid of those because they, they're awful. When you put the finish on there, they're just unsightly and they, you can never live with those. And <laughs> It's, it is, it's horrific. And so you always want to get rid of that, especially if you're trying to make a piece that looks like it was made with some kind of care and traditionally, right? So that's the main thing. The other thing that occurs a lot that you're trying to get rid of is what's called snipe. So right at the end of when usually a board exits the thickness planer, the pressure roller and that it entered with releases. And so the blade slightly raises up and it ends up taking a slightly deeper bite, usually at the beginning or the end. And if, you're, if your pressure bars are poorly set, you've got a lot of that. I know some people, some, and I've been in this camp, when I've, when I've, not, when I've delayed 
setting the pressure rollers, I would just cut my boards longer so I could cut that off. <laughs> Isn't that bad? All right. But that's what you get. So, however, this, this planer is set up pretty nicely, so there's not a big issue here. But we're going to test that subtle camber on here. And now we're testing it because we're wider, we're playing something wider than the blade, and we have potential for the corners to dig in. So the first few strokes, I'm going to just observe where the shavings are coming out. Look, they're coming right out of the middle nicely. If they were all skewed to one side, I would push my adjustment lever slightly to that side, and that actually squares the blade up, and then I would just check again. Now, I'm getting hardly a shaving, so I'm going to dial it forward just a little. This is part of that control to get that thin, even shaving. Okay, it was a little better. See, right out of the middle. Now I'm going to go a little more. I don't know if you can see about the shaving, but it's, it's tapering off to nothing. So there's this, can you see that? It's wispy on the sides. It went to nothing. So there's this camber is doing that. So I'm not worried about any corners digging in. I'm going to advance a little more, get it slightly wider. Here we go. That's a classic. Okay. This is the kind of shaving you'd like because if you look at it right here, I've got the full width, but I've gone to um, nothing on the edges. So now I'm going to, I know I'm set. I'm ready to go. I'm waxed. I'm squared. Here I go. Just got pressure on the nose. Then come back for these. If you get a shaving underneath, it'll slide. And that's it. This surface, I don't know if you can see it in the light, but that is just so nice. I can see one tiny little spot where I've got, I can still see the planar lines right there. So I'm going to hit it one more time. But this is uh, how you can ensure that you won't be surprised by any marks at the end. You've got to have pressure down on the nose. If I put pressure back here, I'm going to ride a wheelie and then kind of fall into the work that way. The pressure is right there. Now, once I feel it engage, now I'm pushing, but I'm still all the pressure is on the front. I'll do it slow motion and then I'm transferring toward the back right about here. But it so I get a full pass right like that. Now I'm going to just go right on across. This is, you're seeing the camber here, I hope. You can see it in the shaving, okay? See that? You're getting that wispy nothing on the sides. That's the virtue of camber. And then you end up with this beautiful board. So this is the jack plane. It's good for edges, for smoothing surfaces. You can even straighten long edges, but there's other planes that really shine doing that. And um, I'm going to show you one of those right now. This is my, this was my grandfather's plane. That's why it's on top. It's special to me. Um, it's a number seven and he was a fine Finnish carpenter. Then he went into uh, police work. And uh, anyway, this got handed down to me through generations and I am, I use it primarily for joining edges. So this is the classic number seven joiner plane by Stanley. And this is made to shoot long edges. So if you have one of this in your arsenal, you can use it for edge joining to glue something up. Now, a lot of times you might think, well, I could just do that on my joiner. Yeah, you can. If your joiner is set up nice, this is like, I go to this when I'm really fussy and I'm concerned about, for one reason or another, that I'm going to get a perfect joint. So let's just take these boards as an example. These are two cherry boards, about seven eighths of an inch thick. I want to match them up this way, okay? So there's the long grain, the comb grain here. I'm a little more plain sawn on these sides. So this is going to be my glue joint. So I'll just make a mark right across there. That's how I want to glue these up, okay? Now I'm going to 
plane them, but see how the grain is running kind of out this way and then it's doing it over here? So I'll flip these up and I'm gonna turn them this way so that I'm planing more with the grain because that grain is rising out of the board more than likely and I wanna be planing in the right direction. Now in order to use a jointed plane, you wanna go like this. You wanna get them flush and put them in the vise and you wanna clamp them nice and snug and so they're flush. And you're gonna plane both at once. So this is wide enough to capture the full width of these. So again, now look, I've got a lot of plane ahead of the blade. So that has to be so really firmly on the surface. I don't know how this is set. I hope this goes well. I didn't actually sharpen this one today because I have kept it sharp in the past. Let's see. Okay. So this is the same thing. I'm putting pressure, transferring it. Now, this type of plane, you do not want a camber on. This is a jointer plane. So this is one that I keep dead straight. Okay, I keep it nice and square. So that when you're cutting this, you're getting a true flat surface across there. Now let's just do a couple more passes. I want to see complete shavings on both sides. One more, getting it. Ready? You see that? We've got complete shavings on both sides. Now, here's the beauty of this method. If, if by chance the blade in the, joint, in the jointer plane is angled, and let's say I was coming, I actually made an angled kind of cut like this, Okay, right across there. Or let's say I actually put too much force on the left and I, that's perfect, but I made an angled cut. As long as I jointed this straight, when I bring them together, see how those angles cancel each other out and you end up with a nice flush fit. So you'll get a square or flat across because whatever you did to that other side, you did the canceling angle to the other. But I think I was dead on square when I made that cut. I really don't know. But now if you check it out, look at that glue joint. I'm flat on the bench. You can't see anything and I'm not even putting pressure, okay? This is just, that's just how it is. That's a perfect glue joint. Um, sometimes people ask, do you put a spring, like a hollow in the middle? Not really, it's not necessary. Uh, that was more of a, an older method to utilize less clamps. You just have to put a center clamp if you've got a little sprung joint like that. Here we've got modern clamps, no problem. We're gonna get a beautiful fit. All right, so that's the jack and that was the joiner. And then we're not gonna talk about the number six, but that's in between the two. And we're not gonna talk about the number eight, because that's even larger. And this is fun for me because I have a friend, uh, thanks Dave, who's helped me out re restore some of these old planes. And I've got almost all this, the same vintage as my grandfather's. Here's the number three. So we've got the number three that goes with the number four. So I just need the two and the one. The ones are pretty expensive. This is the number 62, Lee Nielsen. Now this is different. Do you notice why if we go with the standard five and this low angle jack plane, number five from Lee Nielsen. So this is the low angle jack plane. You see how the blade is laying in on a bed very low. So. Let's go back to the drawing board here for a second. Here, this represents the low angle jack plane. Now where the frog on the, the standard bench plane is 45, the, the angle on a low angle jack is 12 on this particular one. So it's only 12 degrees. Now being that low, you could not have the bevel on the bottom or the cutting edge wouldn't hit. So this is a bevel up plane. 
when you have a low angle plane, you got to have the bevel up. So there's your bevel there. Now, if you're using a low angle plane, you can, your actual cutting angle is the, the bevel or bed angle here of 12 plus whatever you grind your blade at. Like if you went at a 25 degree angle here, add it to 12, you got a 37 degree angle of cut, okay? Because it's the top angle here, just like it was here. It was always 45 here. It didn't matter what you did here, but because you were always 45. Here, you can adjust the angle of cut by how you grind your edge, okay? So if you want a true low angle block plane, you want to have your edge ground at say around 25 degrees and you'll have, you'll be having an effective angle of cut of 37. Okay. That's, that's low. Now, why would you want low? Because especially low angle planes are really great on end grain. So where the end grain is sticking out, a low angle plane shears across those fibers, all those little straws sticking up on the ends, and it does an amazing job. So I'm gonna hold off on using this for a second. I'm gonna show you a classic, another low angle plane. I think this one, this looks like a little more than 12. This is one of the ugliest planes that Lee Nielsen makes, but super effective. It's a massive block plane. It's got a blade that is almost 3 16 of an inch thick. It's 0.175 inches thick. 0.125 is an eighth. So you're almost 3 16 of an inch, it's super thick. And then the whole body is cast beautifully. It's got good weight. The sides are really square with the bottom and you can adjust the mouth here. And you wanna bring that mouth in as tight as almost the shaving is thick so that you just having that pressure right in front of the shaving gives you less opportunity for tear out and just a better performance. So I've got this set pretty nicely, but a miter plane should be used. It shines most in conjunction with a shooting board. So let me show you my little shooting board and how, I, how to use a miter plane. This is the classic low angle plane and it shines, as I said, on end grain. So a shooting board holds hold you to cut end grain perfectly. All right, let me just get my little sample. Here's a couple pieces here. This is a uh, cherry and I just made a rough square cut on a cross cut sled there. And I want to make sure that's jointed. Well, I'm sorry, squared up on the shooting board. So what you do is you hold the board just slightly proud. This has all been nicely squared and we have a video on making the shooting board. If you're wondering that, um, we can link to that as well. You can just go right to that on, but I can see that I'm going to just make a pass here and you're going to see the shavings. I got that set. So there, I just felt it nice and smooth and look at these shavings. They're just hitting and they're, their perfect thickness and size. And this is end grain though. So they just fall apart. They're a different type of, of shaving. Not like this is the side grain shaving. They're more stringy. This is all just holes and end grain. So once you've got that, you could check it out with the square. If you just wanted a square end and hold it up to the light. So nice and square polished end. Now, what about 45s? So this jig, you can also make a little 45 accessory. So all it is, is a right angle established here, and then you measure out and you're going to cut a diagonal. As long as this is dead square, it really doesn't matter if you're slightly off on your diagonal, because you're going to cut one from the right, one from the left, and the sum of these angles will be dead square. Okay. So I'm just going to set it in the jig and I just shoot these screws in. All right. Now we're going to set our 45, which was just cut 
on a uh, chop saw, and but we want it really good. See, that felt a little more pleasant because I'm at a skewed angle, but I can see that's pure and clear. Now, if I flip and do this one on the other side, so you gotta be amphibious for this. I'm gonna just put it out. <laughs> I'm, I'm amphibious. Oh, there we go, it got going. Now, it's the same thing. If I had an error at all in my angle of the blade, I cancel it out when I flip it over and then these two also are complementary angles to give you exactly a 90. So if I bring a square up here and put it on there, let's hold this tight, it's a 90. And man, I wish you could see how good it looks here. <laughs> no, I'll show you right here. Let's put it. Sweet joint. So this is where a low angle block plane shines. It's cutting mostly end grain, and that's where a miter plane works well. Now, the Lee Nielsen number five can work and function beautifully as a miter plane because it's a low angle plane. It lacks a little of the mass of this. It doesn't have quite the same high secure sidewalls, but they're actually, most of them are designed so you could grind this and get a beautiful cut like that, okay? However, I already have a miter plane, so I didn't want to set up my Lee Nielsen low angle plane as a miter plane. So I cambered the edge, and here, it's, and what I'm going to show you next is slightly mathematical, but very, very little. Now, here's, here's a little thing. In planing figured woods, like let's say, here's a piece of that uh, big quilted big leaf maple. It's bubbly. You, if you've had planing experience, you know this kind of grain can tear out and be a nightmare if you're trying to hand plane. Even going through the planer can be an issue sometimes. So you've got to set up your plane to handle this kind of wild material. Now, the European smoothers, the old ones, like the Norse's and whatnot, they are not at a 45 degree angle for the frog. They are steeper. They're usually they're, they're 50 or 55 degrees here, okay? Now, why would you do that? If you go 50 or 55 degree angle of cut, you're steepening up your, your cut. That actually is a more favorable angle to attack highly figured woods like that and not get tear out. A low angle block plane or a low angle plane does not work well on figured woods because it's always lifting that grain which is changing and it's gonna pull it and tear it out. When you come into that steeper angle, you're not allowing it to pull the fibers as much and so you get a, a more flawless surface with that, okay? so. Here's the thing, you don't need a frog necessarily like that, although Lee Nielsen will sell you 50 and 55 degree angle frogs. You can buy accessories just to change them out and you could dedicate one of your planes as a figured wood smoother. So it'd be up at a higher angle. You wouldn't have to worry as much. However, you can turn a low angle plane like this into a smoother by grinding the edge of your blade more steeply. So if you took 12 degrees and you wanted to, let's say, get it to 50, you would grind this to 38, right? So you're getting a pretty steep 38 degree grind on this and your effective angle, sorry, I'm not, is gonna be 50, okay? so. That's going to be a more blunt edge, but it's going to hold that edge longer. And you're just coming in. This is the angle of cut. So even though I got a low angle, I'm going to have a steep edge. And that's exactly what I did to this. Okay. So this has a high grind. I think I put a 35 degree angle on there. Maybe a, a touch. It ended up being a touch more. 
So you've got effectively very close to 50 degrees and I slightly cambered it. So this is going to be left as a figured wood smoother. Let's try it out. Okay. I don't know. Let me double check how this looks. It looks pretty even. I may have to just advance it as we go. Now these are a little harder to adjust side to side. So it's good to have a little brass hammer to adjust side to side. Okay. Uh, you can buy those at Lee Nielsen for $158. No, I'm just, I, I forget how much it is, but they're out of stock right now. So find your way. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start Look at what I'm getting, just kind of, I can feel it hitting these bumps, but I'm getting nice shavings. I'm kind of taking off the tops right now. You can feel the waviness of it. All right, I'm going to slightly advance. I don't want to go too much here because it, it could be a problem. I can see tear out in the other direction here, so I don't think this is the direction I want to be planing when I get over there. But, oh man, this is a pleasure. So look, I'm getting that, I've got a cambered on this. See how it's, it's wispy out at the edges? But I'm at that effective, more close to 50 degrees. I wax the sole. I'm not, I'm not trying to kill this. I can go over it a couple times. The beauty is I'm not having to push down hard at all. You can have the music on. I mean, this does give you a little exercise, I would say. So why not? But this is just creating a polished surface. So I had a little snipe at that one end that I had to clean off. I'm thinking when I get here, I'm going to tear out because I already see tear out in the other direction. Let's see. If I can get a good shaving here, it'll be amazing. So keep in mind, you don't have to grind this. You can get a steeper frog. If you get a, a used European smoothing type plane, it will already have a frog at a steeper angle. I think it's called a York or something like that. Look at that. I mean, wispy, see-through. That's about enough. I think I'll just go that far just to show you what's possible with highly figured woods. That was right off the joiner, had tear out, and it took it away. Here's right off the joiner, not plain. Can you see it in the light? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pass that around to the studio audience. All right, <laughs> it's nice. I get to actually show people up close. All right, so that's a sweet plane. I think I'm gonna keep it set up like that because I already have the miter plane, but you could, dedicate it as a miter and it would be just fine as well. Now here's the last of these up here I want to show you. And this is the classic smoother. This is a, the Lee Nielsen. It's got a wide body. I believe that's, let me double check this. I've always thought of this as being 45. I think it is. I'm going to check it with a protractor right now. And I'm just measuring the angle of the frog to the base and yes, it's dead on 45. So I've got the standard. I do have a, I like the Lee Nielsen blade, but a friend gave me this Hawk blade, an aftermarket. It's a cryogenically hardened. And I guess Lee Nielsen now does that as well with their blades. So I've got the Hawk blade in there. This is a smoother. This was considered to be the final polishing cut that you'd want to put. If you were hand planing, you know, from your apprentice all the way up to the finished surface, this is the guy that you really want set up with a very subtle camber. You've got a wide cut and you're going to take a light, even shaving. Okay. This is a piece of curly maple that was glued up and I've got some tear there. We'll see. This is not technically set up for wild figure because I'm coming in at, at an effective 45 degree angle of cut, but it is a good smoothing plane. Let's see how it treats this. 
first let me get a pen mark on there so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is, um, I gotta look where the shavings are coming out. Little off center to this side, so I'm gonna push the lever over there and then check it again. That looks pretty good. All right, I'm, I've got it set light, even though it looks, and I've, I can feel the wax on the sole just gliding this plane along. Man, that's doing a sweet job. I'm not getting much tear out at all. I can see a little light bit that would probably not exist with the other plane. I wanna finish up with a couple little block plane exercises. This is my favorite block plane. I wanna get the number on it. The 60 and a half Lee Nielsen. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's got a nice feel in your hand. It's nice width, good weight, uh, cuts beautifully. And I've got this little jewel. Thank you, you know who you are. And uh, this is tuned up well. This is also a Lee Nielsen, and this fits even better, like almost becomes part of your hand for little detail work. Now, block planes, as you can probably already tell, are low angle planes. They're great at end grain, but they're also really great at side grain, chamfering, but you can do little details with this beautifully because this has an adjustable mouth as well. So you can bring this forward or back and close it right up thin if, you've, if you're cutting a thin shaving. Now what I usually do, I keep this old Stanley, keep that sharp and honed, and I keep it kind of heavy. So if I wanted to say, just make a chamfer on something, I can achieve that chamfer very quickly with this plane, where this, this one takes a little longer because I'm, look how fine I've got it set just for those little wispy cuts. But it's better, it's more controllable on smooth surfaces because I'm just taking a light shaving and I'm not fighting it, okay? Now, these are great also for little end details. You know, when we do that, um, we do that little pyramid for craftsman style furniture, we usually have, I'll mark around the end. This is like a one inch square. I mark around the end of the, the piece, a quarter inch deep, and then I'll just make a center mark here, right across like that. Then I wanna connect those lines and form almost like a gable roof here. There's one, and we'll hit the other side. Okay, then I could plane all that off, but what I usually do is just go over to the bandsaw and cut it off and I end up with that. Okay, so I leave the line, just quickly bandsaw it off, and now I'm ready to do some detail planing with the block plane. So because this is end grain, I can quickly create a pyramid on the end of this. I'm gonna go, I'll show you, here's the coarse plane. Let's see if this is set up too strongly. Yeah, that's too heavy. So I'm gonna go more civilized here. And I'm looking to see the bevel hit the line in the middle and the line at the edge. That's pretty good. I'm holding it as flush as I can. I'll turn around so you don't get in your way. And I'll do the same thing over here. It also works as a duck call in a, in a pinch. All right, so there you go. We've got beautiful gable roof there, nice and hand plane, nice and clean. So now I'm gonna just put a center line here. That's about the center, right? And I could, with a square, make some lines, but let's just freehand this. 
I'll just go like that. I'm just going from the center point to the corner. This should carry straight from the other side. It's close enough. And then once I get this established, I can put it right back in my vise. And with the heavier one, I'll remove more stock quickly. This is end grain, so this low angle is really effective. Now I slow down, I want to get to the line. I'll flip it around. So I'm going to just go ahead and I could have done a little, that's pretty close, slightly off, but I'm rushing, but you can see the pyramid achieved and we've got nice polished surfaces there. And this would be a classic top to a, a craftsman style piece, you know, so there you go. So the very last thing I want to show you is a little job I realized I need to do on this, on this chest. We've got this issue. I, I, a while back we did a, a, an episode here on putting a cock bead around a drawer front to dress it up a little. So I made this sample drawer. This is not the actual drawer for this case, but this is one of the common issues you run into after you apply a cock bead is that it's a little too heavy and it's falling below the drawer divider. And so it hits right there. So you've got to take the drawer out and you can feel it sticking down below there. Here, you want to use, get a stop on your bench. I'm just going to put a dog here just as something to bear against. And with your block plane, the nice one, right? I'm going to rest it here and go on down. That feels a little too heavy for that. I don't want to, don't want to screw anything up. Uh, I've got a nice light cut there now, I think. There we go. So I can feel I'm just about flush. That feels good. And then you always want to ski tip your ends. It looks like I already did that. So, so let me just make sure. I don't want to feel any bump up there. All right, let's give it a test. See if we can hear anything. You ready? Ooh. Now I'm feeling something hitting. I think it's more in the middle. Oh, it's, it's slightly right on that end. So you can look under there, check it out. I think it's right in this area. I'm taking nice thin shavings. And this is what you have to do when you adjust the drawer. But that's the beauty of a block plane. It's almost like an extension of your hand can that feels much better I might just slightly tweak it there but I'm gonna call that for tonight hey thanks again for hanging out with us here in the shop <laughs> mm -hmm. for a little bit remember if you enjoy this content go ahead and head over to epicwoodworking.com you can look at new courses new plans but thank you so much for being here we enjoy it We'll look forward to seeing you next time.